everyone, this is Blair Sinta. Welcome to the podcast, Recording Drums. Today I'm talking to Nashville session great Nick Buddha. Uh, Nick got his start, um, well, let's just say a, a big break playing on early Taylor Swift demos, which then became records, and he ended up playing on a handful of records, and his kind of crew of guys kind of grew from there. Um, Nick's a beautiful player. He's playing live now with Kenny Chesney, which is pretty great. Um, I dove into Nick's discography a little bit, and I found this Gretchen Peters record that he plays on. That's The playing is just really beautiful. Um, amazing pocket. Uh, so he's also producing. He's recording out of his home here and there. Um, also, you know, tracking live in Nashville, but producing also. Um and uh yeah cool insights great guy um okay as always my courses are for sale uh sessions and lessons um i'm i'm meaning to get a sale on on some of my courses here going soon i'm gonna try to do that this weekend it's a bit of a crazy thing but keep an eye out if you're interested in uh any of my courses snare sound bible uh improve your groove or introduction to recording if you've hit me up for lessons the introduction to recording uh, uh, course is, is really good in my opinion. So check it out. All right, let's get to Nick and, uh, all right, have a great week. Take care. Bye. Yeah, man. Nice to meet you. you man, it's good to meet you too. You sound fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How long have you had your, um, this blog thing going on? I, it kind of started in the pandemic, but it was kind of a slow build. Yeah. And then sometime last year, I was like, oh, I did a handful of these. I should put them out. And then I just kind of just trying to roll with it, you know. Turned into a thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And like, you know, I just uh, try to keep it like, you know, very specific to recording and not, hey, man, where, you know, how old were you when you were playing Rudiments, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, (laughs) you know, yeah. So this is your, this space is different. It looks different than what I saw on your website. Yeah, uh, and my website, I'm I'm guilty of I'm one of those guys that like I got it set up and got all the stuff and then haven't really touched it since. And you know, with social media, it's uh, there's not as much of a need to keep the website going as much, and so yeah, it's kind of falling behind. It's actually in my to do list in the next couple of weeks to really get some. You know, the problem is is like getting <laughs> you got to get all the content to make it whatever and that's a hassle for people like me that don't want to have to think about content you know wow. so but i but i do need to do it yes that was my old studio uh we have since moved to this house okay. um the studio i have in here is uh it's great i mean it's you know it's all my stuff and it actually this room happens to sound good i've lucked out with rooms and maybe that's a partially to do with the room and partially to do with I don't know. I just, I, I have my theory on recording and it doesn't always have to be measure exactly X amount of feet off the blah, 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 and whatever it's, yeah. if it sounds good and it kind of makes sense, right. It kind of works, you know, and if it doesn't, somebody will say this is out of phase or this is blah, 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 and I'll fix it, you know? Right, right. But, um, so this, this room is an upstairs to the house. Uh, it's kind of a loft style room, like bedroom, living full bath kind of area and i've kind of taken the corner of it and made it my studio uh it's not as full of a studio as the last one was this is definitely more of a drum room or an overdub if i'm producing something vocals guitars etc not so much more than that recording at one time you know um but the drums sound good and we live on the river so it's beautiful just outside these windows is water and that's not so bad (laughs) beautiful man yeah uh, and you, but you're connected to the house, like the whole house. Yeah, I'm upstairs. So yeah, you can hear it in the house and it's not, it's not the best case scenario, but it's, but it's okay. Okay. And thankfully my family is okay with me. And just, listen, I'm not playing all the time in here. It's, I get tracks to play on. Um, I play if I'm, if I happen to be the only one at home, I may choose to just play if I'm feeling the thing but otherwise it's mostly work up here you know it's not uh, uh, you know yeah and and i can pick my times too if i'm doing a song for somebody i don't have to do it at that minute i can say okay well, what's your schedule tomorrow cool I'll, I'll take this hour here or a couple hours and do this thing um we have a garage that's actually separate from the house um that at some point in the next i imagine a year maybe the end of this year 
we're going to build on top of, and that will be the studio when it happens. You know? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, sort of a thing that people could figure out, like as a, as players who want to be able to recording from home, you can kind of make it work anywhere, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's, that's the interesting thing about the podcast. This podcast is like, I've talked to guys in, in little dinky random garages, bedrooms, you know, beautiful places like Ash Stone in, in London yeah. he, he or outside of London where he built that windmill thing. So mm-hmm. all kinds of spaces, but everybody seems to get the right sound for what they do. Yeah. Everybody's figuring it out these days. Now, I was just hanging last night with a friend of mine who's a uh, producer out of Toronto. He's here for a few days and I uh, did we normally do full sessions at, at whatever studio together, but he also will have me play songs in my place if he's piecing something together. Mm-hmm. And I just did that for him a little while ago and he just told me it was like, man, the drum sounds so good and things so great. I mean, I will say I'm not um uh, it's almost like I, I stumble into it, but, but, you know, I know it sounds good. When I listen back, I know that it does sound good. Good. Then hopefully somebody else will think so too. <laughs> yeah. You know, of course, you know, yeah. yeah. You've been around the block, you know, mm-hmm. I'm curious. Are you still on the website? It says you're rocking a Digio to preamp. Are you still? No, that's thing? also a But I still have it. I didn't sell it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm assuming one day there will be a use for it because it had the, the black lion mod on it. And it was, it was, you know, the most solid piece of gear I've maybe ever owned. Yeah. Uh, but at some point I went over to the UA Apollo okay. setup. Yeah. And we all have, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it just makes sense. You know, I mean, especially when you're dealing with so many tracks that you deal with, with drums, you know, I mean, I've got the eight P so it's got eight pre's in the back and I've light piped in another eight channels. Um, actually I just got this new unit, the, uh, audience, um, whatever it is, 880, okay. which is great. So I've got 16 channels, um, which I, I don't use all of, but, right. but that's the thing is you've got to have some channels for drums, you know, and what better scenario where you not have to tax a computer by being able to run a lot of the plugins recording on the, on the Apollo. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of insane setup. And if you want to, you've got your different brush, like the brush setting, the full, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it's, it's been after I got used to it, cause it's a pretty big mind set change from what the the old one what the go2 was but yeah that's right. no, great so you so are you off hardware then as far as mic pre's and stuff uh, most of it i you know i have i've got this api 512 uh dual like it's two 512s in a rack thing okay. um and i've also got this what is this the tl audio uh tube pre it's like a dual pre tube pre compressor thing yeah i use those because I, you know, I could do the API thing inside the Apollo the same way, yeah. but I have it. It's set up. I just leave it. I, I literally turn it on. It's in there. I mean, I'm going to be doing this afternoon. I've got a guy coming over. I'm doing a track with them and I don't have to think about getting ready for it. Right. I just turn everything on. He comes over. Yep. We go, you know? So, yeah. But you're using some mic pre's in console. Also, yes, I am. I've, I'm using some Neve um, stuff on the. Uh, what am I? What am I doing right now? I've got, I've got a Neve pre on the kick drum. I've got something else, and not very much. It's a light color. It's not. I'm not going crazy with everything because you know when I send tracks off people, they it can't be so in a vein that it gets stuck there. They need to be able to if they want to. For a while, I was recording my room mics pretty crunchy because they sound when you in the mix, it sounds great. But if somebody's looking to use more room mic for whatever reason, it's almost it becomes a little unusable because it's so specific to where they are in the kit level of what I like to hear. But I'm not the one dealing with it after I send it off. So, right. you know, I dialed some of that stuff back. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. Um, are you, are you EQing on the way in too, through those mic freeze? Mm, yeah, but this is so barely like, no, not really. I mean, it, everything's going in pretty flat. Right. 
maybe yeah. kind of some some bad mids or something here and there or yeah and you know occasionally i'll send somebody like i'll put a little eq on the snare just lift like the very up just a little bit the top end um because it sounds good in the mix but honestly they're going to do that too so most of the time i i really don't touch anything it goes in pretty flat and that's how i send it okay yeah, yeah. Okay. And sometimes what I'll do, I've started doing this recently because somebody mentioned that they do. I thought, well, that's a good idea. I'll send, especially if it's a track where I'm recording the drums um, and then I'm doing percussion with it. And then maybe there's a brushy thing that's underneath or something like that. I will end up sending them an MP3 of how I've got it sounding yeah, just so that they can see when they pull up the tracks, they can see, oh, okay. Because sometimes I'm not sending the whole file back. I'm just sending the the stems and that's it, you know, okay. so they can, uh, put it in and kind of see where, how, when I was recording it, what I was thinking, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of ways guys are doing it. Drummers are doing it. Um, I always tend to send a, a two track mix. Like this is, this is what I, and then sometimes I'll be specific about like, Hey, I muted the rooms or I muted the mono overhead or whatever. Sure. So they give them some direction on, if they if they give a shit well, like what I liked. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that's the thing. Some people some people care more than others at the end of the day. And it's um I try and do a once like a once over here's the I normally have about eleven tracks of eleven mics going. Mm-hmm. Um and I use what they want to use or not. And and if somebody says they want something that has more or something, blah, blah, blah. But that hardly ever happens as somebody's like, man, could you move the, the room mics back a little so I can get like that's I I can't think of a time actually that that's happened. So yeah, not really a thing. Right. Yeah. I was thinking about something earlier this morning. Did you come up do, uh, in Nashville doing demo sessions at all? Or do you still do them? I Yeah. I mean, demo sessions don't happen as much as they used to. Um, I would still do them. Um, there, I don't know if I do them all the time, but there it's, it's fun to get in there and crank out tunes as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Sort of what demos are all about. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but not all the time because it'll, it'll wear you down. But I did at the beginning. Yes. All about demo sessions. But what was interesting, I had a little bit of a different road in, in that I met this producer I was trying to get into doing demos and did a couple here and there. I met this producer. He would had me on all his demos. Um, and we did it with all the same little crew the whole time. And one of those demos after a year ended up being, um, Taylor was a co-writer on it. It was for Taylor Swift. And, and that turned into, well, we'll just keep doing these. And, and it, it made the record. And then the, you know, I mean, it, it was a weird way in cause I wasn't working with a whole bunch of people at that point. I was just, finding my footing and just the right people <laughs> it, it, it just happened to be like that that little crew of um newbies really i mean none of us had really had a prior uh, list of artists we'd work with you know we were all pretty new to the session scene Thank and you. um it just it just kind of blew up like that and then obviously after that as well as records as at that point there were still tons of demo sessions going on that you could fill in the the gaps with but you know those things have kind of gone away i get people that send me tracks that i do at home and those used to be they would just compile five of those and that would be a demo session but now they just don't really do that anymore you know yeah i mean it happens but it's not as nearly as frequent as it used to be okay Th- yeah kind of where i was leading with this is like is it ever in the home studio? Do you ever have someone come over and treat it as a demo session? Like, hey, we're knocking five of these out in the next three hours. We're gonna we're gonna keep that mentality of yeah. that, even though you're at home. You know what I mean? If if it was, I know it's not normally been that because it's normally, you know, a lot of those five se- song sessions they would have three that they really wanted to record and they'd pad it with two so they could get the money in the right space. Right. Um, so now they'll just do the three. Right. <laughs> and sometimes they'll be over here with me doing it. And sometimes they'll just send them to me to do, and that's it. Okay. And, um, it, you know, demo sessions, you go into a studio and I, all I'm doing in that scenario is I'm playing drums on something here. I'm providing the studio. So, and I'm engineering and engineering uh, right. and, and doing all that. So the, so I don't, so I do it a little differently if that's, that's the case. I mean, it's definitely going to 
it's more of a per song thing than a per session thing, you know? And, and, uh, it obviously works out money wise. It works out better for me, but I'm also doing a lot more than, I mean, showing up at a session, just playing drums is easy, you know? I mean, yeah. in comparison to making sure that they, that the drums are sounding right, that they, what, that they get what they want once they go home with like engineering wise. And that all the stuff is right, you know, mic yeah. wise and all that stuff, you know? So, um, but yeah, yeah, it happens sort of like that. And it's also not a full band right. in that scenario. You know, they've got either an acoustic vocal, they put some form of a track together, you know, for me to play to. Yeah. Right. Do you feel like um like from doing those Well, here's another question. When when you were um let's say when you were doing like t- whatever, any record session now, um are, are you given more time for parts and things like that as opposed to the demo thing where it's like, you know, go, go, go. I mean, pretty straight ahead. I mean, I, you know, I feel like I know the answer to this, but I'm, I'm just thinking difference between Nashville, LA. Yeah. You know, in the speed at which things move, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, that's changed a lot over the years as well. It used to be a lot of the producers that were around in the nineties, first part of two thousand and stuff. they, they, the budgets were bigger per song so they could do a song, a session. You know, a session is a three-hour block, right? And um, and the, the union kind of runs things in those three-hour blocks throughout the day, right? So you got 10 to 1, 2 yeah. to 5, 6 to 9. And um, in, in demo world, it was always expected you'd get five in a session. Now, if there was a little higher budget, maybe they would be fine with doing three or four, you know, and then, and then comparatively you think, wow, well, that's a lot for three hours, but actually three becomes a breeze in three hours because you, you get to, instead of it being like half an hour a song, it's now like 45 minutes a song. Mm-hmm. And then you've got oh, a little more than that. And then you've got, that's that much more time to, layer on some things. Well, I thought about this cool thing I could do underneath, like those kind of thoughts go by the wayside with demo sessions because yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to keep moving on unless yeah. it's something we can do within a, a guitar overdub, but that's really where you're putting the tambourine on it. So let's move on, <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. Um, and, and so it used to be with masters that you could just do one song in that whole amount of time. And that meant you could take 10 passes of it and do like alternate things or whatever but even nowadays that's rarely the case a lot of times they're going for two to three songs even for masters you know um in in a session like maybe like i would say two songs is is kind of a norm you know and they would maybe do maybe do like a 10 and a two so you work from 10 to 5 with an hour for lunch in the middle and and they might say like we're going for four songs or something like that you know four to five and see what they can do you know um labels are just it's not that labels aren't making money but for a minute, things got a little uh, iffy with the economy, and they tightened up all the belts. And then they realized, well, we can still make money and keep the belts tight, <laughs> because really, what are we doing here? Like, what we got to do is get this product, what, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I'm going to get into the politics of it. Just, but just like the airlines, man. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where it's like, wait a second, but you guys are now making a lot of money again, but yet, you know, you're still cutting as much as possible on the session side. Yeah. Catering used to be a thing. We used to enjoy amazing catering on sessions. Oh, there is no more catering on sessions. <laughs> I remember so, I remember yeah. bottles of wine and killer dinners and great yeah. hangs. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it's a diff- it's a definitely a different world in that in that respect. Yeah, man. Um uh so how do how do the unions how are they dealing with um like home home session world? And things like that or and and subsequently how do you deal with it yeah now? well uh, without getting myself into too much trouble here um the union actually did a good job of coming up with a scale that was like a single song rate type deal so um and it was very easy because you have to in order to build through the union you have to be a signatory and blah 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 and that used to be a whole thing they simplified all that down so anybody could be that then then when you're getting paid you're also they're also paying into the health and welfare and and all that sort of stuff that comes with the union um however there are times when it's just this song isn't going to be anything like this is whatever it's going to be and i am comfortable 
sort of skating through it and just getting paid for the song and not going through the union, you know, and that's frowned upon. I mean, we're in Tennessee. It's a right to work state. It's not like it's illegal to do that, but, and, and I mean, trust me, I can only say good things about the union in general, because I have been fortunate to have been on recordings where the union really showed just how much better it was for me than if it hadn't gone through a union, you know? Um, So, so I get it. I get it. But at the same time, if I'm going on a case by case thing, sometimes it's just easier to do. Here's a song, pay me on the, on the Venmo, call it a day. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Yeah. I mean, I I feel like the union thing in LA broke down long ago, you know? Yeah. Um, And man, it's been my, my, my union work, Man, it's uh, I, it's like almost non-existent at this point. Yeah, um, but it, it it became less and less. But just with the home studio thing, um, which in my in my, I mean, I think it started to become a little more prevalent out here first. I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it just, you know, they never. Let's put it this way. When you talk to somebody, do you quote union rates? Um, I base it off of union rates, but, yeah. but, but like, that's kind of where it starts. And then you can just, you just kind of get a feel for what people are comfortable paying. I mean, yeah. listen, I'm, a lot of, a lot of the things, if I'm doing them, listen, if I'm doing them here and it's for a record, it's going on the card. Mm-hmm. And I would be the leader on that card because it's just me doing it here and that's how they would file it and blah, blah, blah. Right. right. All good. Um, if it's an indie, somebody or other, it's, it's, you kind of got to go with what they're able to do too. And it's, and I'm pretty, I have a pretty standard rate, but then it's pretty movable just depending on what, on what the deal is. You know, if they tell me it's going to get used in something, but they don't want it to be on the card, I'll, I'll jack the rate up a little bit because, okay, fine. But I'm not, I'm definitely not seeing back end. You've just told me it's going to get used in something. So I at least need to get paid a little more now. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so it just, it just depends. Right. You know, when you take your car and it gets fixed, it kind of depends on what, what needs to get done, you know? So a yeah. little bit the same thing. Oh, and these spark plugs are bad. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, no, well, I'm not coming up with it. It's not like, <laughs> you can see the snare drum I'm going to use on this. I'm going to, this is going to be way more expensive. I'm yeah, really yeah, trying to yeah. pay off this snare drum I got on layaway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, that's cool. So when you, when you found this house, were you, were you, did you, were you kind of keeping in mind having a, a room the potential for it for sure i always have to i mean yeah. there's always going to be a certain amount of work that's going to um be done at home and i like producing it doesn't happen all the time but when it does i've got to have my own place i mean and i got to have a place where i can if i think of something i can lay it down i'm whatever i just i got to have a setup that's just I can turn it on and go i'm not a big fuss with gear kind of person i just want it all be set up sounding great. I can turn it on and do what I need to do. So this house, like uh, I said, this is, um, this, we had already discussed moving into this would be a, a good temporary setup. And that when we get to doing the building on top of the garage, that would be a great studio. So that'll be, that'll be the deal, you know? Right. Are you producing a lot? Not, I mean, not right now. There's a, there's a young lady I've been producing since uh, for a while now and like uh, within the last year and it's cool and where she's about to start we'll start playing her stuff for some folks and see kind of you know the big the big question mark is like i can make something sound great and we've got some good songs and and it's and they're awesome and very creative and cool recordings and then what, you know, so, you know, calling folks that I know and, and, and her doing what she needs to do and, you know, get it out there. But I do enjoy, I really enjoy producing. And it seems that like these projects pop up. It's, it's, I love being creative like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you been doing, have you been producing for a long time or is this kind of something newer you've, you've just grit, like kind of gravitated toward or, no, I've kind of been doing it for a long time, on and off. I mean, like I say, it doesn't happen. It does. It's not like one project yeah. leads to the next one necessarily. But I've definitely been been producing records on on folks. I did a great rock record years 
years ago with this guy. Um, I've done a, a, an awesome soul record right about a year, maybe two years before the pandemic. Um, so yeah, stuff, stuff pops up, you know? And then are you, are you, when you, when you're producing, are you, uh, are you often doing live tracking or is it, or is it home studio people in home studios or, or full band sessions or what do you both, um, this, this, like what we just did, um, with this girl, Lily, um, we did live tracking on all of it and then did some overdubs at home and, and cut some of extra vocals at home and stuff. Um, but I've done stuff, this, the soul, it's kind of like a groovy, funky soul record. I did in my old studio, the ones that you've seen pictures of, um, we did the whole thing in there and did it, like put it together piece by piece. Okay. But it sounds great. It's awesome. It's got horns. It's got all kinds of stuff on it. And we did it all in that studio, you know? So, yeah. Right. Are, you, are you a writer on there too? No, um, not that I wouldn't write and I have written before, but it's not, I don't, I don't really have a passion for writing and I feel like those that write that don't have a passion for it. I don't know. Like if I, if it happened to be something that I was a part of great, but it's not something that I, that I seek right now. Right. But we'll see. Who knows? That should, might change too. Right. <laughs> you know? right. Yeah. Do you feel like you're, you're producing has informed your drumming or your drumming has informed your produce. I mean, you know, they go home in hand in hand. Absolutely. But the earlier, earlier session work you did, um, do you feel like you, you thought like a producer early on or I mean, you see, yeah, what I'm yeah. I, I think that, um, I think to some degree, maybe, but I think having produced stuff and I've played on all the stuff I've produced, not that that would have to be the case. In fact, I look forward to a time that I'm producing and either feel like, man, this guy is the guy that needs to play on this, who, whatever it is and, and call another drummer. Or what I would really love to do is produce a band where they are all in and I'm just the producer. I think that'd be great. Right. Um, that has not happened yet. Um, so I've played on everything I've produced and that does lead to me spending a lot of time with the stuff afterwards and realizing what annoys me, <laughs> what I wish I had done different, mm -hmm. what I should have paid more attention to, you know, all of those things. So yeah, I would say over time, it definitely the me thinking like a producer uh, having gone through it enough times means that when I'm tracking, I'm probably more thinking that way, you know, but I'm always, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a drummer first, definitely. And I, and you know, I, I am a song drummer. I definitely play to songs, but, but being a, but yeah, the producers definitely let helped out with that too, I guess. Yeah. What did you, what do you remember what you found that annoyed you? <laughs> well, you know, I will go for things. Um, I, uh, I am, I can be a pretty aggressive drummer um, at times. I definitely love playing off rhythms that the from the, with the singer, you know, hitting things with the singer or the the lick, the signature lick or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that can be cool. And that can also sometimes like, ah, it would have been cool if that was just straight right there, you know? And there've been some things where um, even with this, the most, this most recent stuff where I go back, I'm like, ah, I shouldn't have played anything right there. And I'll find a way to, to make the drums kind of disappear in a certain area where I feel like it would have been, would have been cooler if it was just whatever without any drums on it, you know? So there's some things that after, and listen, that's, that's my preference as a producer though. Other producers might hear the exact same thing and be like, no, the drums there are great. You know? So it's yeah. preferences on all sides, you know? Objective. Totally. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like you, you start to make decisions in the moment as a drummer, you know, being able to think outside from a, Oh, absolutely. I mean, listen, I, I've been doing session work for long enough now that the only way to become a good session player is time spent being a session player. You know, you can't, you just can't go in and, and like, well, I can play to a click. I mean, yeah, it doesn't do anything as far as, you know, does it, does this enhance the song as a whole? And what, what are you doing right now? That's making it, that's moving it forward, making it come to life, whatever, whatever that is. And, and doing it enough times, you can make the decisions right off the bat as things are happening. This is the best thing for this moment. 
you already know the reason why <laughs> you've calculated all the bits and pieces and that's it. You know, yeah. um, that can change if you have enough time to really dive into it, but maybe not a lot of times second take is a great take <laughs> and yeah. the, the eighth take is no better because I've already sussed it out and there it is, you know? Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you, th- do you feel like, um, like just f- your background at all? Do you, uh, do you feel like you've been influenced by South American, so, sorry, South a- South African, South African, yeah, South yeah. African um, bands, rhythms, things like. It's that. so funny. <laughs> part of your part of your aesthetic. Yeah, it's funny you say that because this literally came up in conversation for the first time days ago with somebody who was okay. talking about African rhythms and asking a good friend of mine last uh, a few nights ago. We were sitting up yapping about it. Um, And I I think to some degree, because I didn't realize that I knew those rhythms until I was in a band that required those kind of rhythms to come up. And I don't, although I can't name them, I know what they are. Interesting. So, um, so yeah, I mean, and there's a certain pocket that comes with that stuff, right? I mean, it's, there's a real um, driving force a lot of it has a sort of underlying four in the floorish kind of thing or some form of, I don't know, something. And yeah, I think it has influenced even if I wasn't overly aware at the time that that was happening, you know? Right. Yeah. But as a, as a kid, you didn't bring over, um, you know, uh, you know, some bands that you were into or anything necessarily? Not, not really. Most of the stuff I was into was American or European okay. rock, you know, that we got six months later and you know, <laughs> right. was already not cool in other places of the world, but I, but I was into, so not really, but there were some local, like when I would travel back after we had moved here, I was just, I was like 12 when we moved here. So I would go back when I was a teenager and visit my dad and my grandmother. And oh, while right. I was there, I'd, I had friends that were obviously still there and we would go out and see some bands. And so I would see some bands sometimes that I thought were really cool taking a sort of Western approach, but with African rhythms and stuff. And I, I, I know a few of those that I got really into. So yeah, in there, you know, but no, I did not come here and start playing drums with a real African okay. vibe about it at all. No. Yeah. Did you, did you start to get exposed to studio work pretty young since, especially growing up in Nashville? Yeah, a little bit. I, I, it's kind of always been there, you know, I, I didn't do a ton of it, but I do remember, um, my first time in the studio, I was, you know, I knew I wanted to go to Berkeley after, after high school. And so I made an audition thing and that was in a studio. And, and that was kind of the first time I really spent time. I was senior in high school or something like that. But then right when I was done with college, I came back here for just a little bit and did a couple rock records with some random folks somehow just ended up in these scenarios. Right. Um, in some of the big studios, none of which are here anymore, but, um, and, um, and so when it came to, and I recorded a bunch when I was in Boston too, when I was at Berkeley, I recorded a fusion record with this crazy guitar dude. And, uh, I mean, oh, like all kinds of stuff. I was always recording, I guess, one way or another. So, so by the time I came down here and I actually started doing that, an actual Nashville session, I was green to how the Nashville sessions work, but I wasn't completely green to recording, you know? And, um, yeah, it kind of, but, but I'll say this, I'm thankful that those first sessions were demos and I didn't get thrown into some scenario where it really mattered. You know what I mean? Like it, it took, it takes a minute to, to kind of figure out how it works and get comfortable reading charts so that when you see some figure, you're not like, Oh shit, what's coming up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it just becomes second, you know, second nature that, that takes a minute. So, uh, you know, yeah. Right. And man, you, you, you recorded with Colonel Bruce Hampton. That's fucking Yeah. Great. That was, that was an early recording experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't have, it's funny when I think about that, we were just in the studio playing. I don't really remember thinking, shit, I've got to make some awesome statement about this record. You know, we just were in there and I mean, Hampton was all, I mean, I was, I was 23 or 24 when we did that and learning this guy who, I mean, 
he was kind of bigger than life, seemingly crazy, but actually more, more on point than any of us ever actually understood. I mean, there was so much mysticism involved. And so there I was just, I was just trying to figure out what the hell I was doing, making this record. It, it came out great. Derek trucks was on it. We had all kinds of guests on it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's heavy. Do you, yeah. do you know Jim white, the drummer? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen, I know that he moved some, some years ago. Yeah. He's um, in Colorado. Yeah. He's in Colorado and he teaches, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of Jim white. He's, I used to see him here play with some jazz guys around town. And, uh, my, I feel like my friend, I've good friends with this, um, woman singer named Annie Selleck, who's just incredible, uh, jazz singer here. And I feel like I saw Jim play with her more than a few times, but yeah, it's great. Okay. Yeah. Cause he has a connection to Bruce Hampton from, I think from Atlanta. I don't remember, but he does. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know. Yeah. That. Uh, I'm not remembering the history. We went to school together uh, and I'm not remembering, but there, but that's how I learned of Bruce Hampton. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. They're in some, in three, <clears throat> you know, I don't know. Cool. Yeah. Um, so what was your, what, when did you start to transition to have a home space, you know, f from, you know, obviously working like a, a fair amount in, in, in real studios? Well, it was when I was wanting to work more in like become more of a session player. You know, I'd been, I'd done a few road gigs since I had moved back here after the, the Colonel Bruce thing. Um, I'd, I'd been on the road a couple of years with some road stuff and I decided I didn't want to just be on the road all the time. I wanted to, I wanted to be doing sessions too. All my sort of idols that I grew up listening to did everything sessions and road stuff. I want to do that too. And at that point in Nashville, there was a pretty thick dividing line between those that, that toured and those that stayed home and did sessions. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, got a little money together and I bought my first little setup at home with the idea that if I had a place that I could do some tracks for some folks for free, even at first, just to show that I could do it. Cause I found out I had plenty of, I had a few songwriter friends that were, that had, that were successful and they were doing demo sessions and stuff, but they had their guys. And just because we were good friends, it didn't mean that they were now going to just use me instead of the guy they had been using, you know? Sure. And, and, um, so I was like, I need to find a way to get in with these folks so that they know that I can, I'm not just a road guy I can actually do this. Yeah. So, so I got a pretty basic, the O2 was, was a purchase. Um, and, um, and a few other things, not very much. And a, and a sort of a basic mic setup. That was, that's what I felt like, you know, some of the mics I still use were from then, like my beta 52 and the kick drum I've used since then, you know I mean? It's right. just, it's killer. I love it. There it is. Um, and, and what that did was, um, is okay. So I had the setup, I, I learned pro tools. It was a definite, you know, heavy learning curve at first, but I got it. And then my friend, Tim had, who's, who played bass on most of that Taylor stuff. Yeah. Um, he was like, man, I know this guy who is looking to uh, cut some drums on a couple tracks. He's got this, a couple artists, blah, blah, blah. And I was very hesitant to call because I wasn't as sure of myself at that point, but I did. And that was Nathan, you know, it was before anything happened and it was only because I had the space and it was in a bedroom. I mean, it was literally in a little bedroom. That was it. And he came over and he just vibed. He liked, he liked the vibe of it. He, you know, the sounds in comparison to now were probably ridiculous, right. but if for what it was, it was great. And, um, and that's what started that relationship. That's what led to all the stuff that led to Taylor that led to, you know, so, I mean, it's a weird, I could not have predicted that, that would have been what came out of spending some money on some gear, but, but there you go. Do you remember how many tracks you were running recording then? Um, you know, I was probably using just a four piece kit. Um, and I probably, I know I had two room mics, um, one. And I and I would have had a top and bottom snare, um, and two overheads. So I mean, I was probably doing ten tracks. Oh, right away! Wow. Yeah, eight to ten. I, I'm I'm trying to think. I, I, I one kick drum, two snares, two toms, two overheads, 
two rooms. So maybe nine, nine tracks. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, yeah, you, you knew that you knew what you wanted to achieve with that. Yeah. 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 And I, and I knew the basics. Listen, I mean, I'd done, I had been in the studio enough to know, okay, I, I need to have these room mics. This is not a big room. So I need to have them as far up and as far back as possible. So they weren't even on stands. I had them attached to the wall yeah. from the corners of the room, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, um, and I had the drums as far back as possible. Uh, yeah. I had some, I had some, um, foam, whatever on the walls, you know, and that was, that was kind of it, you know? So, yeah. Do you feel like you, um, you kind of had like your tuning thing together at that point? No. Uh, and you know what? I don't even know that I really have my tuning thing together now, but, um, <laughs> but, um, it, I've never been, like I said, I'm not overly mechanical with that stuff. Like I don't, I don't get too into the, into the, well, this Tom needs to be this tone, like this, uh, yeah, note sure. and whatever, you know? Yeah. So, um, I know what sounds good to me. And so I, I guess I try and get them to do that. I've learned a lot over the years for sure. Yeah. Um, and a little bit the hard way sometimes, because I'll let some stuff go that I shouldn't necessarily let go. There's a little ring in the snare, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Maybe it's not fine. Cause I know coming back as, as a now producing after the fact, sometimes there's a little bit of a ring somewhere. It's like, God, that is annoying me where to, yeah. and I'm not necessarily as great of an engineer to be able to just find it and get rid of it and not affect anything else. Cause that, as soon as you start doing that, then all of a sudden, well, now the hat sounds weird or now the, what, you know? So, um, um, the, I, yeah, I've learned a lot for sure, but, and I wasn't as inclined that way when my first got started for sure. Right. Yeah. Do, do you, do you, do you spend time still like working, like working with EQ? I mean, not working with studying or, just futzing with EQ, just, you know, trying to progress your engineering skills or you, or you kind of I do sometimes for sure. I mean, um, I definitely get into like one thing I like doing before a song gets mixed and I've tried mixing too. Um, uh, and, and yeah. I, I love the idea of it, but, <laughs> but mixing engineers are, Hey, listen, I mean, I didn't just le start playing drums yesterday. So, you know, those guys have been mixing a long time and they understand, a lot of things that I don't have together yet, you know. So my, my second imaginary career is a mixer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I do like to do is at least hand it off to an engineer with the general sound of what I like, you know. So that means if I want an extra crunch on this vocal thing, I'm gonna may do it in my way, and then they'll undo it and do it in their way, and that's fine. They have the idea. It's not starting from a complete from complete scratch there's at least me doing my bit which includes some degrees of eq and some degrees of you know i'll throw verb i'm um, you know verb on some things and some whatever on delays on some things and blah 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 nothing crazy but at least enough so that okay i like the way this is sounding to me yeah. now make it <laughs> now make it what it needs to be you know right yeah, but but you re, you'll record vocalists, which you're not afraid of, which is like you know I, the sign of a good engineer, as far as I'm concerned. You know. Oh yeah, um, we. I, I I know that I know what I like to use to record vocals, and I use. It's funny. I've used the same sort of chain for a long time, and then recently I've just started doing it all in Apollo. <laughs> I'll just set up the chain in Apollo rather than run through hardware because. Honestly, it's the same thing, except you don't have potential buzzing from cables or whatever else. It's just right. all in there, you know? So, um, and, and I've also committed recording sins as far as engineers are concerned and completely gotten away with it. Just re just on this last, we just did a batch of songs, just finished getting mixed weeks ago. And one of the track, one of the vocal tracks we used from the tracking session because it's, it was, badass i had all the stuff in it mm -hmm. but there was just a little something that she didn't do that i was really hoping that she would have done so we did it here so not the same mic not the same room not wow. the same gear nothing of the same all i did was match the level and you know nobody's ever gonna know <laughs> you know what i mean it's 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 just as good just, and even chad who uh chad carlson mixed it who also worked with me on back in the day um I asked him afterwards. I was like, man, did you notice? I was, I was expecting to get a call from you yeah. 
yeah. you know, berating, like, what are you doing? Yeah. He was like, no, nah, man, not really. I mean, there were a couple of little things, but it was fine. So I was like, good, 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 good. So, so. Tonal, tonally, you, you totally got in the same zone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and I don't know, it's not like I tried that hard. It just, that sounded good. This sounded good. It, it, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't obviously the EQ wise, there wasn't too much difference. I mean, you use one good mic compared to another into good gear, blah, 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 you know, running through a distressor, good to go, you know? So uh, it's yeah. kind of an, it's kind of an interesting um, point is that, you know, when I'm teaching this stuff to people, you know, it's always about like, if, if the drum doesn't sound right, it's, you can't fix it later. It's got to sound right. But if, if your vocal source, i.e. the person and their personality has a thing, you can run them through anything and it's going to, it's still going to sound like it's going to translate. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't so sure that we would be able to get away with it, but man, I would have let it go because the track was so good anyway, that I was like, let's just see, let's just, right. let's just see what happens. And we was like, yeah, it's surprisingly. Okay. That's, that's great. Let's see if it flies and, it, and it's all good. So, yeah. And so what, what were you listening for that you didn't get? Was it, was it phrasing stuff? Was it, uh, she like would go for this. I can't, I can't remember exactly right now, but what I, what I can't, it was in the last chorus. She would change the melody sometimes, um, when we would, when we would go through it. And I really loved a thing that she did and the, and the track that we did, the, the take that we really liked from the live tracking she just didn't do it. Gotcha. And I was just kind of missing it. And I was like, and she, and she, it's not like I had to twist her arm to do it. She was like, oh yeah, yeah, no, let's do it. Let's do it. And I was like, great. Okay. Well, let's just see what happens. <laughs> you know? So right. that was the thing. And we were talking about one line in the last chorus that just had a little melody difference that kind of went up instead of whatever, blah, 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 yeah. that I really liked. And, and, you know, for me as a producer, like, yeah, you can let go of some of those things especially if the artist, if I have an idea and she's like, oh, I don't know, you know, fine, fine, fine. I'm going to throw out the ideas as I hear them. It is what it is, but you've got to throw it out there. Cause that as a producer, that's what you're bringing to it. Like I hear this thing, it could be really cool. And, and I would say 80% of those things end up sticking in the tune one way or another. And, and that's as a producer, as a player, I hear all the stuff all the time, but you always have to be careful when you're working with producers not to come up with so many like, hey, why don't we do this? Hey, do you hear this thing over here? Because you're just stepping on toes. And and, and I've, I've learned that over the years. I think I've probably, uh, you know, as a younger, as a younger uh, musician in the studio, I'm sure that there were times that I was a little too vocal about, man, wouldn't it be cool if maybe maybe not maybe it's not you know maybe there's there's go you got to be careful how you bring that stuff politics of yeah politics of of uh you know whatever work in the studio but but yeah as a producer i love that stuff right and then uh, so as a producer you're i would assume that you're trying to bring you know obviously your friends but also the right players in so you have to not say as much to be treated as if how you would want to be treated in a session, right? Like, yeah, but you know, it's interesting. I actually, I love when everybody, like I would never, I have no ego going in, okay. you know? And, and I'll say one thing I've learned after years, cause I mean, I think when I was younger, there was a little more ego. There was like, yeah, you know, I, I guess, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but what I, what I know about now is, it's a group effort and no producer is going to make something happen all on their own. You hire the right guys um, who bring the stuff. And a lot of the guys I like to hire also produce, you know? Um, and, um, and yeah, I can tell them, I want to, I want to work with guys that I feel comfortable saying I, that's not working. Can we try to do a thing like this? And they're not like, oh, fine. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. yeah, man. And, and there's a positivity about it and we can play off ideas off of each other and they're not taking it personally. And there's nothing of that stuff. We're all in a creative process. Yep. I love working with the guys that I call to work on sessions for. That's why I call them to work on sessions. You know, I love working with them. They have great ideas super musical and we can all just gel in a complete non 
uh, egoed way about yeah getting the best out of whatever we're working on. You know. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a that's the thing to strive for is to yeah. feel as though you're you're adding your creativity, but your ego is left behind, and that's hard to separate. That takes a long time, yeah. I think. Yeah. To get your yayas out, you know, as what you want to, how you where you want your career to be, but then also understand that you're a, you're a servant, you know. Completely. I mean, I mean, whether I'm a uh, player or producer, I'm working for somebody, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, I might think something like, "How can you not do this? This is the best way to treat this part of the tune." Mm-hmm. For me but not necessarily for them. And they may not hear it that way at all. And, right. and it might be like, Oh, I can't believe I'm losing this. What I think is a great idea and the perfect scenario for this thing, because they don't like this thing, but it's okay. It's, yeah. it's, we're, we're just, we're just working together. It's like having a conversation and, and coming out like, okay, well, I may not agree with you, but I respect, I respect that. That's how you feel about it. And that's great. You know, um, do, you ever, do you ever feel, are there moments though where you feel like, hey man, this this needs to be in here. I gotta, it's gotta happen. So I'm gonna, I gotta strong arm you a little. You know what I mean? Well, well at least, hey, can we try this and just see how it sounds? And if uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if you know, maybe it does. You know, that it, it would be more like that. You know, I don't the, there are more times where somebody will say, <laughs> "This has happened on a session yesterday, I think, where the producer who I'm friends with, so." It wasn't anything weird. It was like, hey, man, can we do this thing where you do the thing, but it's on the crash? And I was like, I don't think you want that on the crash. He was like, really? I was like, yeah, because that's going to sound like this. And it's and it did. And it sounded very 80s. And it was like, yeah, that was a dumb idea. OK, but whatever. So, you know, I mean, there's certain things that from as a drummer coming from a drummer perspective, I can as they say it, I'm like, no, here's why this isn't going to work, because but then I will admit that occasionally I'm wrong. It sounds ridiculous to me. <laughs> and then they're like, will you just try it? And I tried them like, all right, all right, fine. <laughs> you know, I get it. So yeah, it just depends. But those those little scenarios come up every so often. I'd say 90% of every session kind of goes the way that you feel like it would go because they're as they're the other players or the producer or the artist is leaning on me as the drummer to to do the right thing on the thing. And most of them don't know any more outside of what I'm bringing to it. They may say, could we do this on the thing when it gets to the bridge or whatever? Yeah, sure. I'm, you know, but for the most part, it kind of flows the way it should go. You know, you're, you're the specialist. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So let me, I'm, let me think about, let me kind of ask the same question though, but as you, as a producer. Yeah. Like, like the kind of strong art. I'm thinking of a particular example, and I won't use names, but a well-known producer and a band that had a huge hit, and him telling me, he's like, man, I know that I knew that I had to show the show up. He mixed the record, but he also, he's like, I knew I had to show up all the way to mastering to make sure this thing was in this tune, ah. which then became a, a pretty huge hit. So it was like that ah. kind of thing where he was like, sorry, man. You may not like that thing, but this is like the hook. This is a part of this tune. This has to be in here. You know what I mean? You're saying you're saying the producer was the one that was really wanting to stick with it, so the band yeah. wasn't as into it. But the, the band producer- the band was maybe a little iffy on it. Like yeah, you know? yeah. And I'm not talking about as a drummer. I'm talking about you as a, as a producer as a whole yeah. thing. It's not like oh man, this you know this fucking percussion thing's got to be in there. It's gonna make the yeah. song. It's not like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you know what I mean? I think. I haven't come across a scenario yet where there was something that seemed that integral to the song that the artist didn't also agree with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Cause I feel like it would be, it'd be difficult to push something as a producer when the, I guess if the artist is iffy on it, I would potentially say, Hey, listen, we'll do, we'll do an alternate if you want, but I really feel like just live with this for a minute. Yeah. Hear it mixed with this. Right. Let's just let's just let it sit for a bit. And if you still absolutely don't like it, because listen, I'm I I haven't as a producer, I haven't worked as like with a with a big label so that it's me having to bounce between what the label wants and what the artist wants is as most producers have to do. Right. Right. Um, 
or that, that pressure, was, or that pressure to have a hit maybe hey exactly exactly i think if that were the case yeah boy i, I don't know i don't I, I would tend to push my my view on it over the artist if that was if unless the artist was absolutely opposed but if the artist was with it i would i would have to push it because that's what I would be doing. <laughs> that would be my job. Like, right. I really feel like this is the thing that makes it. Right. Yes. You know. Right. So yeah, yeah. But yeah. No, it's interesting. I there's, I there's, really it's, it's interesting the two hats to wear, like the, 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 uh, the experienced session drummer that really understands, like, uh, you know, from experience what what will most likely work and most likely not. Right. And, and then the producer, where, you know, you're a guide but also kind of have to be a strong arm sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. I've, I've been fortunate where most of the folks that I've worked with have gone with me on ideas that I've had. And most of the time it's worked out well, because even my initial idea of something like, Hey, I think we should treat the section like this. Even that may change once we get into it a little bit, but it's, but we've decided to go down that road, I think is the point, you know, and then, and, and thankfully, I've I've worked with artists that have been trusting of me and okay to see what happens and then happy with it, you know. So yeah, right. Yeah. Are you are you searching for a band or uh, to look to to work with, or is or is these things kind of more like happen more organically? You know, they kind of happen organically because I don't know how to search for a band. I mean, you know, part of the problem is is I would love my you know hey the antenna up i mean if there's something that something that comes around but you know there's two sides of it finding a good band and then finding a good budget and yeah. um those things do not often come together um but um but i would love to i'm, I'm certainly my eyes are open for it you know yeah. anybody's listening no but um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um I mean, you never know who knows you right? never know yeah yeah <laughs> And I mean, I think you put it out there. And I mean, not just, um, obviously I'd love to produce a band. I, l I just want to keep producing. I really enjoy it. And, um, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not in marketing. I don't know necessarily what to do once the record's done, but I can certainly get a really great record done, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. They have, they have people for that. They have uh, different brains for that. Yeah, that's right. Thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, thanks Nick. Yeah. Nice to talk to you, man. Nice yeah, to it's good to talk to you, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope your session goes well today. I love that. Oh, you got, I got love that you got serious sunlight coming in that in that room, man. Yeah, man. I, um, I don't know if I can hear as we take this over there. Maybe you can get an idea as we get close. What the. Oh, dude. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm serious. There's water out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, have, I got a good little like setup. A, and, you have and like it's a. Not, it's not a big setup. I mean, it's just it's just a, an old kit with the mics and stuff. But it's, but it completely works. You know. So yeah. Um, you have a margarita like sitting out there at like all times for a break. <laughs> at all times. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I have like a for like one of those frozen margarita machines just sitting on the deck. There. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It looks pretty nice there. The weather's weather's. You guys got good weather by now. It's yeah, it's so weird. I mean, yes, I think last night it got down to like 40 degrees or something like that. It's so it's not like it's hot yet, but I love like I'm quite happy right now. It's probably 70 outside. Let's keep it there for a while before we hit summer because man, it's it, it gets hot fast when it gets hot. Where are you at? I, I wasn't, I'm not even sure. I'm in LA, I'm in uh, Glendale. Oh. Yeah, oh, okay, cool. I'm gonna be out there in end of July ish or so. Okay, touring playing. Yeah. Um, so I'm out. I'm, I'm, I haven't been on the road in very, very many years, but this uh, summer I've started playing with Kenny Chesney. So, so I'll be out in LA at the end of July. Where are you guys playing? Uh, the SoFi Stadium. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Wow. Chesney's, Chesney's sells some tickets. Yeah. That's tickets. Yeah. 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 It's big. We just did our first gig last Saturday in uh, Tampa. And at the at the what are the, the the Raymond James Stadium where the Buccaneers play, and it was insane. I mean, sold out sixty thousand people. It was nuts. Is it how how does it feel to be back out doing it? I, I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm loving it because I you know I came back out of session Monday morning 
that's great. You know, um, I'm still home most of the first halves of every week, you know, which is great. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't be, I can't, I feel so fortunate to be in with such an amazing crew. Like the, the that whole camp is, it's been the coolest experience far beyond what I would have um, thought getting into it originally, you know? And I mean, it's a, the whole, this whole deal has been going on for two months, two and a half months or whatever. So it's not, it's, it's still pretty new, um, but it's, I'm loving it. Yeah. It's really great. We're, we're playing in Charlotte on Saturday and I'm really looking forward to it. And we, it's, a, it's a big rock show. My hands, I've, I've never had calluses like I have right now. I mean, just beating the crap out of the drums and having a great time doing it. So, yeah. That's great, man. Yeah. I th- it's, I think it's really great to keep up, keep up, keep a balance. You know, yeah. you know, yeah. your, your creative juices at home and then just, just playing just for, to play and play, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's, I, I love the, I love the fact too, that there is such a freedom in his organization to be you. Oh yeah. I came in and it was about make the gig years, do what you want to do on it. It's not about what's been done before. Make it, make it you. So I get to, like sometimes it gets a little crazy. Sometimes I do some ridiculous stuff, but it's, but it's, but it's very fun. And, and it's, and it's a rock band, three guitar players for crying out loud. You know wow. I mean? It's, it's great. And and all of them rocking along. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really good times, man. That's the rare thing these days. I feel like, especially on a, a big gig like that, where the thing that you just said, just go ahead and yeah. do it. Man. Yeah, it's complete. It's, it's a, I feel like it's a little bit of an anomaly because there's, we're also not really using any tracks. Only a few songs even have tracks on them. You know, wow. most of the time it's just the band all live. There it is. You know, are you, are you so, on a click? Yeah, we play almost everything on a click, which I really like because yeah. a, I don't have to count anything off. <laughs> <laughs> um, their count offs on the thing is great. Right. And I don't have to always keep time when, if there's something where the drums aren't playing for a minute, I can just enjoy it and not have to have this hat going through the whole thing. You know what I mean? Which yeah. annoys me when I have to do that, you know? Yeah. So no, it's a, it's a good scenario. Most of, like I said, there's four songs maybe that have sounds going on percussion, y kind of things or other things. But other than that, yeah, I'm playing to a click, but that's it. Man. Congrats on that gig. That's yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, is that yeah, gonna, yeah. Is that gonna go all year, the touring? Uh it ends at the end of August. Uh I don't there's nothing I don't know if you'll do something in the fall or not. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. But um that's but yeah, pretty, we're pretty good. It's pretty day. much every weekend between now and the end of August. That's awesome. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. All right, man. Yeah. Well, well maybe man, I'll see you out here, man. Who knows, you know? Yeah. I hope so, man. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll keep in touch and thanks for your time. Hey, man. Thanks. Good times. All right, Nick. All right. Take care. Yeah, man. All right.